Good morning and welcome to Bible class here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, it is a bright, uh, sunny, but cold morning here, uh, and uh, we welcome you as we uh, continue and conclude our little six-part series on the little letter uh, that we know in the Bible as uh, Second Peter. And uh, we welcome you, whether you're uh, a few people in the building with us this morning and uh, others that are joining in in town or halfway around the world. It's uh, wonderful to have you with us today. Now, just a few uh, housekeeping matters before we get right into things this morning. Uh, first of all, if you uh, want a copy of the lesson notes, they are available at the church website. And you can download those and uh, print them off if you would like, uh, use them for notes and uh, whatever else uh, you'd like to do. And uh, you can also uh, uh, email me a question. I'm not sure that that's coming up on the screen just yet from what I can see on the monitor, but there we are. Uh, my email address, uh, astley at holycrosskitchener.org. Uh, that is, uh, if you have a question, I have my phone uh, with me here this morning, and uh, we will uh, take a couple breaks along the way to see if we have any uh, comments or questions that we can, uh, we can discuss uh, sort of together. Uh, also, uh, many people have done this over the last little while, too. If, if something strikes you after class um, and you want to just shoot me an email later, that's perfectly fine. I quite enjoy um, uh, responding to those. In fact, last Monday, I, it was pretty much the whole morning's job, uh, responding to emails and, and questions that had arisen in people's minds after Bible class last week, and that's a perfectly good use of my time as far as I see it. Now, a little, another little sadder piece of housekeeping. We'll use our uh, little girl from Valentine's Day again because she has the exact expression uh, that, that goes with me, at least, as I have to make this announcement. We're going to enter recess again uh, on Bible class. Uh, we are reopening next Sunday for uh, in-person worship services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And uh, as much as it might uh, seem like there's a whole hour in there uh, that we could squeeze in a Bible class with uh, all of the cleaning that needs to be done and all the procedures that need to happen as we bring people into the building for the second service, uh, we'd be down to about a 20-minute Bible class time, uh, which really doesn't uh, satisfy anyone, and then everyone would have to leave, and we'd have to clean again and come in, and, and uh, we just sort of run out of time. And as we're in the season of Lent and already calling on our volunteers to live stream our Wednesday evening service, it seems uh, a bit uh, unreasonable to ask them to come in another night, and it's frankly very difficult to find another time. So we'll go into recess until after Easter, and then in the true Easter theme, we will resurrect Bible class, uh, and we'll see what our situation is then, and whether the format is in person, online, we'll, we'll make all those announcements. All right. Uh, a few fun things um, coming up here from uh, different uh, things I found on the internet. There's been a lot of talk uh, this week in our part of the world anyway, and anxiety and speculation about a possible third wave uh, to the pandemic in this part of the world. And I just want you to know that there is now a whole new way that you can present, prevent yourself from getting the virus from somebody else and being modeled here uh, by Dr. Fauci. Uh, this is obviously photoshopped, but um, it's a cool idea. Just everybody walk around with a fan on their, uh, their heads and blow all the virus away from yourself. There you go. And if the day ever does uh, open up for us to uh, travel again, uh, Days In has a uh, special uh, that you might want to take care, of, uh, take advantage of. They have 32-inch uh, HD TVs, eggs, waffles, biscuits, and the gravy hot tub. The gravy hot tub. I I don't know about that, but anyway, I think I think they're trying to get too much on their sign and uh, leading to a bit of a different uh, meaning than they intended. At any rate. Um, and big news this week, of course, I actually took some time on Thursday afternoon to uh, watch the Perseverance uh, probe land on Mars, and, uh, and of course, the whole big thing about that is finding life on Mars, if such a thing uh, exists. Uh, I have feelings on that, but we won't get into the, that argument this morning, but lots of fun on the internet with that this week. Uh, of course, uh, there's life on Mars, first picture that was taken, uh, there's Bernie and right there, he's waiting for this whole thing. He's got his mitts on and everything else. But 
That shouldn't surprise us because if you're a kid that grew up in the 60s like I did and spent your Saturday mornings watching cartoons like I did, you know already there's life on Mars. Marvin the Martian has been there for a long time. All right, and one last little fun thing before we launch into things seriously here. Hymns we don't sing anymore. Um, this one is called, <laughs> There's Crap on the Door. Uh, it wasn't supposed to say that. It's a printing error. Uh, what it was supposed to say is there's crepe on the door, and crepe is sometimes spelt with an A or an E in the middle. Uh, crepe is that stuff you, is, you, put, you, you would put a black um, linen on your door if you were in a time of mourning. But somehow when the hymn came from England over to North America, somebody forgot something, and it uh, came up with a whole different meaning um, than, than we might otherwise have. I, the, the, the words are, are, are truly astounding as well. Let me just read the first verse to you. Uh, Ring the bell softly, there's crap on the door. Uh, now one is sleeping, uh, his sor whose sorrows are o'er, while holded, folded hands and calm, silent breast, that's the next slide here, Peacefully, lovingly, now take their rest. Waiting the judgment day. We're going to get to that here this morning. Passing before, ring the bell softly. There's creep on the door. Anyway, we don't sing that one. Um, the third verse is also outstanding in terms of its melodrama uh, that it introduces to the hymn. Safe to the tomb, let the loved one be born. Stilled the hearts that are bleeding and torn. God in his wisdom has taken his own, leaving your fireside so dismal and alone. Oh, my goodness sakes. Um, soon we will meet upon heaven's bright shore where there will never be crap, crepe on the door. <laughs> All right. Like I say, we don't uh, sing that, although I have, uh, to my family, suggested that might be a good one for my funeral someday. But um, they've, they've said they'll note that. All right. Second uh, Peter. We're into chapter 3. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter, rather, is dealing with the false teachers here and uh, teaching particularly uh, about the Lord's return. Let's just quickly summarize. Um, uh, oh, no. Hold on here. I had another little uh, piece that I, I almost forgot to include. Paul, Peter is dealing with false teachers here. And over the last couple of weeks, there have been a number of um, emails and, and comments that um, we haven't really addressed directly, but I'd like to take a moment to, to address them this morning. Because some of you have written in and, and have responded um, too, but I, if there's uh, one question, there's probably 10, and, and I've gotten about 10, so that means there's probably many more. What about, in our day and age, pastors and teachers who err but are not outright heretics. Like, I mean, there's some of the people that are on TV that are just so far out there, quite frankly, I don't think it's particularly helpful to watch them. Um, it, it may actually be harmful to your faith uh, to tune in or to some of the, the, the people that teach and, 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 and things like that. But there are many others, and we named a couple of them uh, last week. Uh, folks like Billy Graham, a guy uh, you know, who was known world over for his, his preaching, uh, happens to be, among other things, a predispensational millennialist. Uh, another one that's on the TV this afternoon, Charles Stanley. Uh, again, predispensational millennialist. Do, do, do you throw out all of Billy Graham's sermons? Do you um, set aside all the teachings of these other people because we differ with them on some points? And everybody's going to come to their own conclusion on that. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all kind of thing. But um, the church has, over the centuries, dealt with this question because Christians don't always land in exactly the same seat when it comes to every last teaching that's in there in the Bible. So theologians over the, the centuries have kind of identified a, a sort of core set of, of teachings that um, you know, are probably best summarized up in, in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Um, and, and these things uh, include, this is not, uh, this is not the, an extensive list. I just wanted to, for the sake of, of time, to pull together a few of these really core teachings. And if we're in agreement on these things, 
then, yes, indeed, we can profit and grow, in fact, from listening to each other, even if we may disagree on uh, other areas. So there are some things that are called fundamental doctrines, uh, the core, if you will, things like the Trinity, uh, sin and its consequences, uh, the person and work of Christ, namely that Christ was true God and true man, and that by his life, death, and resurrection, he has provided redemption for humanity. Uh, the Word of God, uh, that, that God speaks to us through his Word in the Scriptures, that it is his inspired Word to us. And then that there is to be a return of Christ, a bodily resurrection of the dead, and life everlasting. As I say, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are kind of some of the core things. And, you know, while we may differ with some other teachers on other matters, um, where they hold these things in common with us, yes, it's, it's profitable um, uh, to, to read from these things and to grow from these things. They may have some ways of helping us understand things that we haven't uh, perhaps seen before. I look in my own library, for example, and while it, the preponderance of books is Lutheran uh, in, their, in their background, um, the, 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 they're not the majority. You know, in my own library, the majority of books come from other sources. Uh, most of the books are Lutheran, but you know, we can learn from other people even if we disagree with them. There are secondary doctrines, and here, for example, with a, a person like Billy Graham and I presume Charles Stanley, we part company a little bit. Uh, he, you know, they don't, for example, don't typically see baptism as something that creates faith. They don't understand communion in the same way that we do as the real presence of Christ. Um, uh, you know, those are important uh, problems, and uh, we need to be very conscious that when they write, they are not um, necessarily talking about the same thing that we are uh, when they talk about baptism or communion. But um, again, uh, the, 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 that doesn't, on the, on the surface, just preclude them uh, from any kind of, 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 of study or, or help to us in our uh, walk. Uh, and then there are certain things that are non-fundamental doctrines, um, things like, you know, the exact plan for the end times, uh, angels, the age of the earth. Um, these are all things that You'll find Christians all over the spectrum and have been for centuries on, on these kinds of things. And then there are certain things that are you know, completely open questions, you know, how the church governs itself, uh, you know, certain worship practices, how did evil come about in the first place. Um, these, are, these are questions that are, are somewhat more open. And we learned a rule in seminary that I've shared with a couple of you in emails uh, this past week uh, that um, really is, is the key. If you're using someone who, who comes at things from a different way, be real careful uh, as you eat it. It's somewhat like eating fish, where you eat the meat and spit out the bones. And uh, so, yes, you, you can profitably use uh, voices and influences from other directions. Uh, not everything has to have, you know, the Lutheran stamp on it. But you need to be very careful that, you know, you're using and getting out the things that, that belong to what we talked about before, you know, the core doctrines of the faith and not being led off into something uh, that we don't necessarily uh, believe, teach, or confess. Anyway, uh, as I say, that question's been sort of hanging in the, in the background, and I wanted to bring it to the foreground uh, today. All right, the real issue uh, in the uh, congregations to whom Peter is writing is the question of when will Christ return? And this is not just a question about um, the semantics of the thing or the, the, the fine details. Um, this is a question about um, the, that really goes to, to a fundamental doctrine, even though I said a couple of minutes ago um, that uh, a not, you know, the, the, the exact scheme of things at the end of days is, is a non-fundamental doctrine. Um, the way it's being taught in Peter's churches is, uh, hits into the fundamental doctrines because it really gets to the heart and core of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come uh, to do. And so, uh, just to recap uh, the, their argument a little bit, scoffers 
will come. And uh, these people are not just scoffing at uh, the, the promised return of Jesus. Uh, these people are scoffing at Jesus himself, uh, that maybe Jesus wasn't who he said he was. And once you start asking those questions, you're asking really serious questions. You're asking uh, questions that are fundamental uh, to, our, to our faith. And so Peter is warning these people in strongest possible terms to, uh, to, to his, his congregation to avoid these teachers because uh, where they go with this you know, kind of seemingly uh, somewhat more innocuous question is really to the heart of of these things. Um, and so uh, this is the, the key uh, quote uh, that he gives us from them. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything has continued on as it was from the beginning. And then Peter, if you recall, uh, said that these people are forgetting, deliberately forgetting, some very key things. And this is where this question begins to go deeper than just simply when will he come back, uh, when will he be, uh, you know, what will that look like, and, and that sort of thing. Um, he, what, what they're toying with here and what they're really beginning to teach is that, um, that God does not intervene in the world. He tells them that they're forgetting that God has been here for a good long time and the world has been here for a very good long time. And uh, God did not just set this world up like a, a watch to let it run and sits off in some corner of, of uh, the universe somewhere uh, watching it unfold and just sort of not really involved in what will happen down here. But God is a God who intervenes. And, uh, you know, he's, he's talked about this in a couple of different ways. You know, for example, about uh, he used the flood, again, as an example of God's intervention. Way back in the history, the, the, the uh, time before we can actually even put, you know, dates on it, uh, God intervened with Noah. He doesn't uh, just sit back and let the world run. And a similar but even greater thing has happened in the coming of Christ. God has intervened in this world, and uh, he, he is involved in this world, and he will ultimately intervene in a very visible uh, way uh, at the end. Um, the, the question isn't whether he's going to intervene or not. And this is, as I say, this is gets to the
could be tempted to go there too. I said last week about 100 years ago there was a major convulsion within Lutheranism uh, about this very same thing. And uh, we'll skip that picture altogether. Well, uh, and, and what gets tied into this in, in the U.S. Uh, standpoint uh, from U.S. politics is when things like the, um, the embassy is moved to Jerusalem uh, Israel has a very key role to play in all this, and uh, this was highlighted by many uh, preachers and teachers in the U.S. Uh, when, when President Trump did this as you know, one of the things ushering in uh, the ending of the days. And uh, uh, you know, a lot of pastors and teachers in the U.S. could stomach uh, a lot of the you know, moral uh, failings, for example, that President Trump you know, sometimes talked about quite openly, uh, for the sake of his position on Israel, and uh, because they felt he was, you know, um, aiding uh, th their view of the end. Uh, just a real quick slide on on how, uh, you know, what's our response to this? Um, it's a, uh, it's never taught by Christ, um, not once. <laughs> Um, now, I realize that's an argument from silence, and not necessarily the strongest argument uh, is an argument from silence, but um, uh, w when Jesus doesn't mention it at all, um, you kind of have to take note of that. Uh, Jesus does cover all the important stuff, and he's very clear about his return. He talks about that repeatedly, uh, but never w once in terms of you know, a millennium or, or any of that sort of thing. It's just, just not there. The other thing to really understand is, is uh, Revelation is, is what we call an apocalyptic book. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. Not even going to uh, really go into that too far, but numbers are, the numbers in Revelation are most often symbolic. And in a thousand years, um, you know, is really meant to be a very long space of time, not, a, I don't think, a literal thousand-year uh, time frame. And uh, when you go through Revelation and study it very carefully, it actually describes the end of the world no less than five times. And uh, uh, Revelation 20 happens to be one of those places. Uh, and at each time, the picture's a little bit different. And we need to... Uh, um, understand that when we study uh, these things. And then Israel really consists of all who trust in Christ. That's the New, De New Testament definition of Israel. It's not related to a, a geopolitical nation uh, at all, um, because within a few years in the New Testament, really, um, the people of Israel will no longer be a physical nation. Israel, Jerusalem will be destroyed. Uh, the place will be overrun by the Romans. And uh, Judaism, you know, for all intents and purposes, lives as a, as a diaspora country spread out all over the place till right up to the end of the Second World War. Um, and then the other thing that, that uh, is, is maybe a little more subtle but very real nonetheless is that this whole business of Jesus having to take on Satan in one last great cosmic battle really undermines what he did for us on the cross. Um, uh, you know, what happened on the cross and, uh, is that he defeated Satan once and for all. Yes, indeed, he still prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, but he's defeated. He's, he's lost. And uh, really, we're engaged in a kind of mop-up uh, uh, operation, um, it's sort of like the hockey game, you know, or, or any sporting event where one team is way out in front early, and you know that you know they could play this game till next Tuesday, and the other team's not coming back, and uh, that that th th that's what's happened here. So we teach something very different, uh, a much more simple thing that we're in a kind of the, the millennial age that is sometimes talked about is is really the time we're in right now. The age of the church, where Christ is ruling through His people um, to um, to you know in in the world, um, it's not a earthly kingdom. Uh, Jesus didn't never came to establish an earthly kingdom. It's not ever going to look all that powerful in this world. God's ways don't often look all that powerful in this world, but He is reigning through His church and working through His church to bring about uh, His good and gracious will. And at some point. Uh, there will come a second coming and, and the final judgment 
and uh, the ultimate separation of good and evil. So that's a little bit on uh, the, the, the problem plaguing them. Um, audio gone, audio back. Okay, right, okay, good. We're on? We're on. Okay, good. Audio on, audio off. Well, you can do that on your own too, you know? <laughs> Except for the people in the church here, they can't shut me up. They, they got to endure. Okay, let's get into, you know, now, now uh, having sort of debunked the false teachers, uh, Peter now uh, gets into teaching uh, what do we believe? What, 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 what are we, uh, what's important to us? And we're going to focus uh, for the remainder of our time on the final uh, verses of this letter where, where Peter teaches us a number of important things. And he begins by going at the whole question of timing here. First Peter, or Second Peter, rather, chapter 3, verse 8. Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a, thousand, uh, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And what he does here, Peter, is uh, draws on Psalm number 90. Psalm number 90 is a psalm that was written by Moses, uh, and uh, perhaps the oldest psalm uh, that we have in our uh, collection that we call the book of Psalms. Uh, Moses was a man, too, who struggled with God's timing on things. Um, we'll see that a little bit in our, our Lenten services as we, we focus on, on Exodus. Uh, you know, this didn't just happen, snap, 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 snap. Uh, it happened in God's time. You know, Moses, for example, you know, between the time uh, that he grew up uh, to when God called him. There's this 40-year gap where he's out tending, tending the sheep. You know, th this happens on God's time, not, not on Moses' time. And so he, he makes the comment in, in Psalm 90, a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or a watch in the night. And what both Moses and Peter are getting at when they talk about, you know, a thousand years being like a day and vice versa, is something called kairos uh, time. Uh, there are a couple of different Greek words that are used for, for time. Uh, chronos is the, the, the word for, you know, kind of what time is it? What's the chronology? What are, where are we at uh, in, in the day, the, the, the week, the month, the year kind of thing? Kairos is a different kind of understanding of time. It's sort of the appointed time, the special time, um, the decisive uh, time, um, the time when God seizes the moment to do His will. Now, here in North America, we're rather obsessed with, with Kronos time. You know, church starts at 11, and 11 means 11. It doesn't mean 1101, it doesn't mean 1102, it doesn't mean 1059, it means 11. Other cultures are not so obsessed with, with chronos time. Uh, you know, a, a time may be given for the, the starting of the event, but that time is, is not necessarily meant in any way, shape, or form to be absolutely literal. That's sort of around the time this will begin. And when the time is right, when the right people are there, when uh, we're, we're ready to go, then and only then uh, will we uh, begin. And uh, so, uh, back in the ancient world, there was, again, the, the kind of the competition for the understandings of this. And this is the sort of thing that falls a little bit more, much more into the, 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 the kind of thinking that's not quite as uh, familiar to most of us North American people who live by our watches and our day timers. And this is what we do at this hour, and then we do this at that hour, and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but God's time, when God says it's time. And uh, he'll seize the moment to do his will. And there are, uh, I won't uh, go into the Bible passages that are here, uh, but uh, on the lesson sheet there are a couple of Bible passages. A couple of Old Testament events are particularly highlighted uh, for having use, using the this, this same kind of idea, the, the whole timing with Noah, for example, to go back to him again. We've talked about Noah a lot in all of this. Uh, the, 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 the Scripture says, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. 
That word determined there is a word that reflects that kind of, this is the appropriate moment. This is the time. Um, I have determined this is the time to do what I need to do here. Same with the Babylonian captivity uh, in another uh, kind of unhappy incident. Um, Thus says the Lord, um, a city that sheds blood in her midst so that her time may come and then makes idols to defile herself. He's talking about Jerusalem here. And uh, the time comes when God can stand this no longer. Perhaps the best meditation on this sort of uh, understanding of time comes in the very familiar uh, third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes where he talks about that there is to everything a time and a season. Uh, that's Kairos time that he's talking about here. He's not talking about Kronos time. You know, you, things happen when they're going to happen and not according to the clock or the calendar. Uh, uh, they're just going to happen when they happen, like being born, like dying, like when you can get out and do your planting and when it's time to uh, pluck it up again and uh, when there's times of healing and, and, uh, and building up and times of weeping. These don't happen according to the calendar. They happen to, according to a whole other understanding of time altogether. And so Peter is digging into that here and having you know, people realize this isn't happening according to some chronology, um, which sort of gets to the bigger question, too, of uh, w- you know, in talking about the Lord's return, a lot of people try to put dates on the whole thing, you know, do their calculations and add this number to that number and, and uh, figure out when the Lord is going to return. Uh, the, the, the whole business is a kind of goofball exercise because Jesus himself says um, he, he doesn't even know the time. That is the Father's alone to know, and the Father alone will reveal that time when the time comes. And you know, what they're doing there is they're taking this other style, you know, the usual you know, North American, European understanding of time, everything we can fit it on a calendar, we can make predictions and all of that sort of thing, and then saying, okay, let's add up all these numbers, subtract a few numbers, multiply this by whatever, and boom, uh, we've got the time. You know, I'm, I've been in a pastor long enough now to have lived through a few of those times when everything is going to end. I mean, this is, this is it. We've got the calculation down. We've figured out the code. Forget it. I mean, that's, you're just not even operating uh, with the right uh, system, if you will. All right. So Jesus also is big on the Kairos timing. Uh, for sake of time, we won't go into that too much, but everything happens according to the time, particularly uh, when he gets talking about the end of days. Uh, This isn't going to happen according to any kind of human calendar. Um, uh, It's going to happen according to God's time. Uh, Perhaps the the most uh, clear passages from Mark 13 and the various parallels that it has, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels nor the Son but only the Father. And how do we interpret this? Well, is God, is, you know, God just being obtuse with us? Is God trying to be difficult with us, confuse us, confound us, upset us? Hardly. This is another sign of God's patience. Um, the Greek word that's used in, in, the, uh, in Second Peter is, is a word actually that means long-suffering. Uh, um, the, the, the God is you know, in a sense could bring this all to an end right now, but he's long-suffering, he's patient, he wants people to have that chance to repent, he wants his kingdom to grow and to expand and to include as many as possible, and he's, he's long-suffering with his, his people. And um, uh, he, Peter will reinforce this a little bit later when he talks about bearing in mind that this patience of God uh, means salvation for us. Uh, if, if God wasn't patient, if God wasn't long-suffering, people wouldn't come to faith. They wouldn't have the time to come to faith. They wouldn't experience God's love in this world to make them ready for the world to come. Uh, and he says, just as our dear brother Paul uh, wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave to him. So, that's sort of point one. 
uh, don't put the human calendar on God. Uh, he's going to do this in his time. Now, when the time comes, what's that going to look like? And this is an interesting passage, uh, what comes next here, and we'll spend a few minutes mining out a, a few things out of here. We'll pick it up at uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. We'll just stop there for just a half a second, and, or, because he, he really uh, gives us a lot in, in one verse there. First of all, he tells us that uh, uh, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Uh, a kind of an odd analogy for, for Jesus to use some unsavory character uh, or uh, you know, sad event uh, to talk about his return. Uh, but Jesus does that more than once uh, in his, his teaching, and uh, Peter picks up on it. He's undoubtedly heard those words directly from the mouth of Jesus, uh, an analogy that stuck with him. And uh, one, of the, one of the places that Jesus uses it is Matthew 24. Stay awake. You don't know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect. Now, you know, what he's, he's getting at here is not that, that God is going to do evil uh, when he returns, but that God is going to return, and in so doing is going to uh, come at a time that you know, we may not be ready. Um, that, that, that this is... Um, this is uh, um, uh, we're not to be terrorized by this, but, but it, it is, it is going to be like that thief coming. It's, it's going to be a, a kind of a surprise to a lot of people. And the key is to be ready for his return. All right, we're going to plow ahead here because what time is running. Uh, the clock, uh, the chronos is moving fast, and the appointed hour of 11 is approaching. So we'll keep going here. What does he tell us about that day? Um, three things. Um, the, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The earth will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and every, everything and everyone in it uh, will be laid bare. It's a rather frightening kind of image of the Lord's return. And... Um, it's a bit of a challenge to interpret that because, uh, well, certainly the, the, the return of the Lord will be uh, you know, unmistakable and, and right there for everyone to see. Um, uh, there is a sense that um, Peter is borrowing a little bit of this apocalyptic language as he talks about it here. Um, uh, that uh, he's, he's using imagery that often comes in Revelation. There are fires all over the place burning in Revelation, and there are great noises all over the place in Revelation. And so what he, I think he's really trying to get across are not the absolute specifics of, of what is going to happen to, to the world, uh, that it's just all going to be incinerated, um, but that he, you know, that, that it is going to be cataclysmic. It's going to be, uh, it's going to forever change the course of the the rest of our eternal existence. And uh, you know, there will be noise with that. There will be fire associated with that, undoubtedly. Um, uh, so anyway, but I mean, these are all things that uh, uh, people can look at in, in, in any number of different ways, and I don't claim to have the definitive answer uh, about all of that, and even a couple of the commentaries I consulted also were kind of like, we, we kind of think this is apocalyptic talk, but it's, it's not necessarily that either. Uh, everything being laid bare also sounds kind of spooky, you know, having your whole existence, you know, laid out bare for everyone to see. I mean, most of us have a lot of things we don't want even to admit to ourselves, let alone 
have laid out there for the whole world. But we need to remember to interpret things like this in a, in a gospel way, not a law way. What's really going to be laid bare when the Lord returns and exposed for the whole world to see isn't uh, you know, just how bad we were in this world and how little we really followed the Lord, but what's really going to be laid bare is our faith um, and what God has done in our lives. Uh, that's where the emphasis is going to come. God isn't coming back to belittle and you know, humiliate people, um, uh, but to expose uh, the, the work that he's done in our lives. And that's the thing that we also need to remember is going to be laid bare. So, um, with all of this happening, he, he moves to a, a question. Uh, we've already talked about this question a little bit, picks it up in chapter 3, verse 11. Since everything is going to be destroyed this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Um, our lives uh, are to, in a sense, uh, work to speed oops, the Lord's coming. Now, what does that mean? I mean, how can we influence God's time? Uh, we live holy and godly lives, um, um, and, and we, we, you, what he's, he's really kind of saying here, I think, is that we live in a way as if we're eager for that day to come. We're not going to make that day happen. That's going to be in God's time, in God's time alone. But we live with a kind of eagerness. We look forward to it as if it was going to happen tomorrow. We live our lives in a kind of continual consciousness of the fact that this world is passing away, that the Lord is returning, and that he is laying before us the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and, and this is, a, I find personally, a very comforting way of looking at what is to come for you and me eternally. Uh, the old image of, of you know, God's people sitting around on clouds strumming harps. Um, I like the harp. I, I, it's, it's, it's lovely. I cannot feature myself playing that for a thousand years or, or for eternity uh, or, or for you know, too long. Uh, uh, the, 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 I think the, the more wholesome uh, scriptural analogy uh, or Im language for what is going to come for you and me and uh, the, the faithful everywhere is a new heaven and a new earth. Um, Isaiah talks of that already in Isaiah chapter 65, a new heaven and a new earth, a place of eternal, eternal joy. There's meaningful existence. There's work. We're given jobs to do. Houses are built. Lives are lived. Um, uh, eternal lives, free from death, free from sorrow, free from sin. Paul talks about this too when he talks about creation ultimately being liberated from the bondage to sin and brought into glorious, the glorious freedom that God has for his whole creation. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, the long passage, the long chapter on, on resurrection where the trumpet sounds, the dead are raised, the mortal is clothed with immortal, death is swallowed up in victory. Very much the sense that you know, we are going to have a bodily existence in the world to come. Uh, it's an immortal body, it's, it's, it's a changed body from what we have now, but it's going to be a meaningful body that, that engages in the things that God created his people to engage in back at the beginning again. Um, so therefore, beloved, he says, um, he reminds us to live out our baptismal calling, uh, that we are to be uh, ready for that day uh, as, as God's children. Uh, in our baptism, we are in Christ and united with him, and uh, that's shown in lives that are characterized by obedience and peace. And then finally, as we wait that day, we engage ourselves not in speculation about when the day is going to come or debates about what has to happen before and that sort of thing, 
but he says to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It all comes back to that, that we grow in Christ and we grow in what he's teaching and what he has done for us. And when we grow in that, then we're ready, no matter if it comes this afternoon or not for thousands of years yet. The Lord will return, but as we grow in Christ, we are made ready, and these are the things that we are to focus ourselves on in this time of waiting. Well, I apologize that uh, we've had to kind of rip through uh, some fairly uh, significant material um, here at the end of the book. Uh, ideally, we'd have another week yet, and we could unpack this a little further, but um, the time has come for us to reopen again, and, and that's uh, of paramount importance to the church. And uh, we will uh, continue to grow in these things uh, as we, as we uh, get back at it again. There's a lot of questions that are uh, coming in this morning, and um, I'll address some of those uh, directly back to people during uh, the days ahead and if other things that we've kind of glanced off fairly quickly here um, uh, are questions for you, please, uh, please let me uh, know and I'll, I'll do my best to help you. So thanks for tuning in these last weeks and it's been a joy and a blessing to teach and let's close quickly with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we confess that uh, so often we get impatient with your time, uh, whether it's uh, in the bigger things like your plan to bring this world to a close and to usher in a new heaven and a new earth or the, the more mundane things, uh, how long will this pandemic go and when will you finally allow us uh, to get back to the lives that we enjoyed uh, previously. Uh, we confess, Lord, that uh, we struggle with that. Help us to uh, focus on uh, your time and to trust that time. And in the meantime, uh, to focus not so much on ourselves, but on our Lord Jesus Christ who makes us ready, uh, who came in your time to be our Savior and our King. Bless us now as we prepare our hearts to worship you, that we may do so in spirit and in truth, for Jesus' sake. Amen. With that, we'll sign off, and uh, we'll keep you posted on how and uh, when Bible class returns in the days and weeks immediately after Easter. God's blessings, and we'll be back on the air in 11 minutes with our worship service.